Hi everyone. Today we're trying to understand the fundamentals of structural dynamics by understanding the undamped free vibration of single degree of freedom systems. Dynamics is nothing more than a dance and a game between mass and stiffness. So to understand this dynamic behavior of any system, we need to understand its mass and its stiffness. And it is these two quantities that play a dance and play a game in time by constantly changing the acceleration and the velocities and the positions of the mass. So by the word undamped, just means that we're not considering any loss of energy in our motion. So in this case, we're not considering friction or air resistance or anything that could slow down our mass. So the mass will go and vibrate forever. The free part just means that there is no external force. So we need to excite the mass in some way in the beginning, but after that, the mass will oscillate on its own and we're not applying any force to the system. By SDOF, this stands for single degree of freedom and just means that the entire motion of the system could be described by a single quantity, in this case, the displacement of the mass. So if we go back to the title and we see three examples of systems that could be described as single degrees of freedom. And why is that? Because the mass is concentrated on the top of the structure. So if we know the position of the mass, right, in either of these three cases, we know everything about the structure. We know the stresses, we know the, the, the strains, we can calculate everything. And we know the acceleration of the mass, so everything that we are looking for is described by that position of that mass. And that's what defines a single degree of freedom. Now, what's the parallel between these three structures and this uh, theoretical system? The mass is self-explanatory. You can see that the mass is concentrated at a particular point in these three structures. Now, the spring stiffness is given by the column. So imagine that the mass is a little bit to the left in this case. The column has to be bent, but the column does not like the fact that it's bent. So we'll try to push the mass back to, to the right, so then the column stays straight. But it's exactly when the column gets straight, the velocity of the mass is non-zero. So the mass will continue to move to the right, and then it will get to the right. And then the column will be bent to the right, try to push it back to the left. And it's this back and forth between mass and stiffness that creates the oscillation of, of your structure. So what's the idea here? The idea is to find this x of t, what we call the equation of motion. So a, an equation that describes the position of the mass in every point in time, so then we can analyze our structure in every point in time. So that's the objective here. So let's consider moving our mass a certain amount x to the right. When we do that, the spring stiffness will be activated because the spring will be under tension, and we will try to push the mass back to the left in something that we call the elastic force. The elastic force is equal to the spring stiffness k times the elongation of the spring, which in this particular case is the same as the displacement of the mass. So this elastic force also has an interesting fact that there's a minus sign. This minus sign just means that if x is positive, let's say to the right, the spring stiffness will, cause, will be under tension, right? And will cause a force to, to the left. Uh, if the displacement is to the left, the spring will be under compression and it will cause a force towards the right. So this minus sign just means that the elastic force is always opposite of the position x or the displacement x. So if this is the only force we have, and according to the second Newton's law, the sum of forces has to be equal to ma, we can rewrite that minus kx equals ma. And this is valid for every displacement x that our mass uh, is, is at. So if we're trying to find this equation of motion, this x of t, we can say that this equation of equilibrium is also valid for every time t. So minus kx with respect to time equals ma, and acceleration also being with respect to time. But we know something interesting, that the acceleration, by definition, is the second derivative of the position, or the second derivative of the displacement. So we can replace acceleration by this uh, quantity written in such a way, and we get to the famous dynamic equation of equilibrium, which is mass times acceleration, written as the second derivative of displacement, plus stiffness times um, position. And that has to be equal to zero at every time t. Now, we're trying to solve this dynamic equation of equilibrium. And you might look at the equation and think, uh, what is the function that uh, starts repeating itself after two derivatives? And if you think about it like this, you quickly remember that a cosine wave uh, has that property, right? So if we consider a cosine wave with certain amplitude C1 and a certain frequency omega, uh, and we do two derivations, so we get the first, we get the velocity, uh, then the cosine becomes minus sine, but then because of the chain rule, 
the, the omega factor has to pop out, right? The, the frequency pops out. And then when we differentiate again and get the acceleration, it becomes from minus sine becomes minus cosine. And again, the omega has to pop out. But what's interesting is that we started with C1 cosine omega t, and we ended up with something times C1 cosine of omega t. So then if we replace back this equation of motion, if we replace it back into the dynamic equation of equilibrium, we can see that this can only be valid if omega square equals k over m, right? And this leads us to probably the most important equation of today. That is, the circular natural frequency of your motion has to be equal to the square roots of your stiffness uh, divided by your mass. Now, the circular natural frequency, in terms of units, has units of radians per second. It's the natural units of, of this uh, quantity. Uh, you can write it with units of seconds, and you can also write this with units of uh, uh, hertz uh, by writing the period and the frequency respectively. So you either do 2 pi divided by the circular natural frequency and you get the period, and that's in seconds, or you do the natural frequency divided by 2 pi, and then you get the units in hertz, which imagine, for example, a person that walks at 2 hertz means that a person walks at two steps per second. So when we say a people walk at a frequency of two hertz, means that we're saying he walks with two steps per second. And these two units are equivalent in terms of the information they provide uh, of your motion. And it's up to you to decide which one you want to show. Now, it is important to remember that the same way this derivation works for a cosine wave would also work for a sine wave. So if you repeat this derivation considering now that the equation of motion would be a sine wave, you get the exact same conclusion that this only works if the circular natural frequency is the square root of stiffness divided by mass. So if these two equations, uh, cosine and sine, could be a solution of the dynamic equation of equilibrium, uh, we get that the addition of the two would also be a solution. And this is the general form of our equation of motion. Now, how can we find C1 and C2? For this, we need boundary conditions. So the initial conditions of our motion, that is either an initial position or an initial velocity or a combination of the two. So if you remember what we discussed in the beginning, we need to excite the mass. We need to start the motion. And this is described by position uh, or velocity or both. So if we assume the initial position is x0, we can say that at time equals 0, the motion has to give you x0. So at time equals 0, your sine goes to 0 and your cosine goes to 1. So you just get that C1 equals x0. And if you consider now the initial velocity, and knowing that the velocity is the derivative of your equation of motion, of your position, you get that the omega n uh, pops out, right, from the chain rule. And then if you try to say that at time equals 0, you want the velocity to be v0, again, the sine goes to 0, the cosine goes to 1, and you just get that C2 omega n equals v0. So you can rearrange and say that C2 is the velocity divided by the circular natural frequency. And this leads you to the final shape, or one of the final shapes, of your equation of motion, which is initial position times a cosine wave plus initial velocity over the circular natural frequency times a sine wave. Now, let's look into an example, and let's consider that our mass is equal to 2,000 kilograms, and the stiffness of our spring is 8 kN per meter. At this stage, you need to understand that these units are not consistent. So if you check, uh, the international system of units, uh, newtons, by definition, are kilograms times meter divided by second square. So if you want to do any sort of calculation in, in engineering, you need to make sure your units are consistent. So you need to make sure that newtons and kilograms and meters and second squares are being used. Or if you use different units, you need to make, you need to make sure that they're consistent within themselves. So in this case, we can see that kilonewton and kilogram don't match. So either we transform the kilonewton into newton by multiplying by 10 to the 3, or we divide the mass and transform it into tons, and we get just 8 divided by 2, but you get the same solution at the end. And in this case, the circular natural frequency would be 2 radians per second, and your natural period will be 3.14 seconds, and your natural frequency would be 0 0.318 hertz. So let's look into an example considering that the initial position is 4 and the initial velocity is 0. So I take the mass, move it 4 meters to the right, and then let go. Uh, you can see in the graph, this is the, the plot of this equation of motion. Okay, uh, And you can see that indeed it starts at the position of 4 and it has a initial velocity of 0 being the initial velocity, the slope 
of the position, right? So you can see here that you start with a slope of zero. In this example, the amplitude is equal to the initial position, which makes sense since we're considering that we don't have any damping. So we don't have any way that the system can lose energy. So if we place it at four meters on the right, it's going to oscillate always between plus four and minus four and will never stop because there's no uh, loss of energy. Another thing you can measure in the graph is the period. So if you measure the, the length in time of this wave, you get that is indeed equal to 3.14 seconds. These other two quantities, the circular natural frequency and the frequency, can also be seen in the graph, although it's a lot more difficult to measure, and the period you can measure directly. So the circular natural frequency of two radians per second just means that in two pi seconds, you fit two full waves, so one, two, and the frequency tells you how many waves you fit in one second. So if you go here to one second, this little bit will add to 31.8% of a wave. And these two to another 31.8, and this bit to another 31.8. Now, consider another example that uh, instead of using just the initial position being 4, we give it also an initial velocity in the direction, that direction, of 8 meters per second. As you can see, the position is 4 and the initial velocity is positive and in this case equal to 8 meters per second. You can see that the period is the same. It's still 3.14, but now we have an issue that we don't know how much is the, the amplitude. And this would also be valid if you take the velocity to be negative. In this case, I'm assuming velocity of minus 8 meters. So you push it, your mass to 4 meters. And then instead of just letting go, you give it an initial velocity uh, towards the left of, of 8 meters per second. And in this case, again, period, it's okay, 3.14 seconds, but now the amplitude is, is a little bit of a mystery. So there is a way to rearrange this equation in, a, in such a way that we can see the amplitude straight away. Uh, I'm not going to show you the derivation uh, for this, but you can see it in the description below. But the idea is the amplitude is equal to the square root of the initial position, uh, squared, plus uh, the initial velocity over the circular natural frequency, also squared, and then you take the square root of, of all of that. So you get 5.66 meters. And that adds up quite well to these two curves that we were looking. And you can see that either positive uh, velocity or negative velocity gives you the same answer, which makes sense because of this uh, square term here. That doesn't matter if it's plus 8 or minus 8, you get the same uh, amplitude. Finding this amplitude is very important for engineering because it's the maximum uh, amount of, of displacement. Not only that, because we're studying a structure and we're studying it as a single degree of freedom, Knowing that maximum something is very important for engineering. So if you know the maximum displacement, you will know the maximum stress, you will know the maximum strain, you will know the maximum acceleration, whatever you need for your design. So finding this amplitude is, is crucial for, for what we're trying to achieve here. Uh, before we, we finish, this angle phi uh, is equal to 0 0.79 ra uh, radians. It's not that important for, um, for design, but I'll explain you what it is. So a cosine wave usually starts at its peak. It starts at its amplitude and you can see in this case this wave is a little bit delayed and this wave is a little bit anticipated and it's this phi that gives you how much uh, of this anticipation you, you have in, in your wave but again not very important for for the sake of designing a structure so uh, in conclusion we discussed about the dynamic equation of equilibrium for undamped free vibration uh, mass times acceleration plus uh, stiffness times position, and we describe dynamic system as a dance between this mass and this stiffness in every point in time, changing the acceleration, changing the position, but always verifying simple equilibrium equations. Uh, and obviously understanding this motion in time is, is what we're trying to, to achieve. Um, the circular natural frequency, this one is crucial that you remember it, square roots of stiffness divided by mass, and pay attention to your units, uh, equation of motion. We gave you two, two options today. Uh, one, amplitude times a cosine wave, having the advantage of finding the amplitude straight away. And this one, if you know the initial conditions, you can write it in such a way. So initial position times a cosine wave plus initial velocity divided by the circular natural frequency times a sine wave. So thank you for watching and have a good one.